Hi everybody! We are going to talk about radiation biology and safety today. This is a fairly lengthy one. There's 45 slides, so this um, is probably a lecture that you'll want to chunk up a little bit, <clears throat> not necessarily sit and watch all of it at once. These are the objectives for you. Uh, I want you to think in terms of, because we're talking about radiation safety and the effects of radiation on the body, if you have experience with uh, radiographs in the past, if you are a dental assistant and you've taken them for years, um, or you worked as a dental assistant for a while, you may be accustomed to the um, sort of the regularity of, radi of x-rays every six months, every 12 months, and sort of just like, you're due, it's time to take them again. But we want to think about it in terms of our patient's actual needs um, based on their risk for disease um, and, their, and their risk assessments that we take when we have them in our chair. And so this can be a very different way to approach it because it doesn't just, it's not a cookie cutter, everybody gets the same thing. Um, now, that being said, the patients that we see in our clinic do tend to have a very high rate of periodontal disease and decay. So we do take a lot of films um, in that kind of regular every six months to every year, depending on um, their age and that sort of thing. Um, usually, usually once a year is what it ends up being. But it's hard because we can sometimes become very automated and feel like that's just the correct answer. But the correct answer is to prescribe x-rays based on somebody's need and risk assessment, risk for disease, um, not just every year because we feel like it and because insurance will pay for it. So that's what I want you to try and use that frame when you think about um, prescribing even though it's actually the dentist who prescribes the x-rays, but when we talk about um, recommending, or if a patient who, you may have a patient in your chair one day who's very healthy and says, do I need x-rays? And they don't have a history of cavities, um, but your, your practice tends to take x-rays once a year. And they might say to you, do I need them? I mean, do, is this something I actually need? And then we want to be able to refer to the guidelines that, and the recommendations from the ADA and realize that the guidelines do actually give a large window for a healthy individual of when they um, could be due for x-rays. And it's not just a year. It can be up to like um, 18 months or more, 36 months. It can be up to three years. So we want to have that understanding so we don't just say you're due. It doesn't matter about anything else. Um, so we'll go, so you can, um, this here says, um, homework, um, and I'm probably, um, going to, uh, have, I want us to have a chance to read some case studies and then talk and then decide when those, uh, people might be, um, recommended that they would have radiographs depending on their, um, their disease risk, their risk for disease. So don't panic if you see the homework. Um, we'll talk about that uh, later, and I would give you specific instructions for that. Um, OK, so why is it important to have knowledge of radiation biology? The, the basic kind of down and dirty reason is because uh, radiation does damage to our um, cells and gives, it causes biologic changes. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a tiny bit of radiation or if it's a lot of radiation, it all damages. And But the good thing is that a little bit of radiation that is spread out over a, um, a long period of time and is only covering a small portion of the body is doing cellular damage, but not enough that it would cause a disease or it would cause us to notice anything um, because our bodies can handle a certain amount of it and we do a fairly good job of healing. Um, but we are still utilizing something that does cause physical damage. So it's important for us to understand that so that we can sympathize with our patients' concerns, we can educate them on the realities of what they're actually being exposed to and their risks, and that way they feel better and then we are doing our part in educating um, our patients.
So all ionizing radiation is harmful and produces biological changes um, and um, damaging effects. Um, and it's, it's been documented very shortly after they discovered radiation, they started to notice the biological effects. People got very sick and died because they didn't realize the dangers in the beginning. Um, and ever since then, we've studied people who have been in um, nu nuclear fallout or who have been exposed to high doses and try and understand where that dose threshold is, where too much is makes you sick and, and you know, this dosage, you'd be okay, this you'd be, have some of these symptoms, but you'd survive, you know, so we're trying to understand the range of exposure for radiation. So effects of radiation on the atom. So when the X-ray or when radiation comes in to the cell, it either comes in and um, and hits like the the nucleus with all the important stuff that's in the center there of the cell, um, and it actually it either comes in and hits that or it comes in and hits an electron and it uses all of its um, power and knocks the electron out of, um, out of that orbit. And then the, the radiation uses up all of, it's kind of done, it's, it's spent, it's used up all of its energy. Um, but now that process is ionization. So now there's an ion that's been produced, a floating um, electron, and then a positively charged um, atom molecule. So and that's the process of ionization if there's a sort of a direct hit. Um, the other thing that could happen is the radiation comes in and the cell just gets excited. And you can think about it as ripples on a pond or strumming um, a guitar string. The X-ray photon interacts with the atoms, the um, electrons in the orbit, orbiting um, the nucleus of the atom, and it causes the electrons to vibrate. So they might just vibrate and like produce some heat, some um, kind of offing of some heat as energy release, um, or, and then they might settle back down and go back to normal, or the molecular bonds may break, it might disrupt the molecule, and then you would have, um, you would have the, the cellular um, death or the biological changes just maybe a little bit later than if you had that direct, that direct hit and the ionization. So it's, the, it's two different things that can happen, sort of a direct hit and then sort of a secondary, like slower process. So this is just a little um, image of an X-ray photon coming in and being either absorbed by the tissue causing the vibration of the excitation can cause the um, bonds to break, which will lead to chemical changes and biological changes or ionization which um, leads to chemical changes and biologic changes. So they both sort of result in the same thing, unless the bonds don't break. If it just vibrates and then settles down, then that's fine, nothing happens. But if the bonds end up breaking after the excitation, then the result is ultimately the same with either. So I can't play this video um, in this, screen recording because you don't have any sound, but watch these videos in the PowerPoint no recording because they're really, they're really good. This one's just a really neat, beautiful video. It's just relaxing and cool to see. So it's a little more entertaining and kind of an example of what excitation might look like. And then this TED Talk, Is Radiation Dangerous, kind of just spells out um, a few things to just give you kind of a good overview um, understanding. It's just an, um, a good little video. Okay, so the effects of, of radiation on atoms. So you can either have the loss of cell function or you can have cell death. Um, and neither of them are really good things. They're, they're both things that um, we wouldn't want to see. But um, the chemical changes sometimes are more obvious on the more sensitive radio sensitive um, tissues and cells. Um, so, or things that are far more important for um, our things that we would notice like DNA damage and things like that. Um, so 
loss of cell function or cellular death that is in small doses in areas of the body that aren't so radio sensitive aren't going to be you know really nearly as big of a deal or even noticed at all so here again is another flow chart it's um, similar you can think of x-ray photons as sort of small packets of energy you know flying at the um, the tissue or the part of the body that's going to have the radiation and then you basically break it up into these two categories if the photon comes in direct contact with contact with an electron in an orbiting around an atom knocks that electron out that's ionization if it kind of just maybe does a drive-by or kind of a flyby and just causes excitation it can produce just harmless heat and light or break the molecular bond and then that cascade of events is very similar to ionization. Okay, so effects of radiation on the atom. So we're made up of mostly, we've heard this before, mostly water. So in a cell, we got 80% water. And then we have 20% of other kinds of molecules, which collectively we'll call the chemicals of life. So it's all kinds of things. But for example, it's like DNA, RNA, ATP, ADP, um, things like that, like um, just all of the things that, all the, the actual substance that makes up a, um, a cell or, or an atom besides water. But it's a much smaller, um, it takes up much smaller space, like mostly it's, you know, we have all this water and then a little bit of really important chemicals of life in the center. So it's a much higher likelihood that when the radiation comes in, that X-ray photon comes in, that it's going to hit water rather than hitting something in the chemical of chemicals of life. Um, so ionizing radiation with a molecule of water is called radiolysis. So when the um, X-ray photon comes flying in and hits, uh, hits the water, and that, um, that process is called radiolysis. So ionized water molecules form free radicals. And so you have um, an example of this would be a molecules containing unpaired electrons. So H2O is water, but then once you take one of those electrons out of there, um, then you just have a, a hydrogen atom and then a hydroxyl group. Um, so, and those two things are extremely chemically reactive. They want to pair up with something because it's a positively charged hydrogen and it's a negatively charged hydroxyl group. And so they are looking to stabilize. So they're floating around wanting to pair up with something. And that's when the electron hits the water. That's when you have these free radicals. So here's sort of a little diagram of it. You have the X-ray photons coming into all these water molecules that are in the cell. They hit them, they become ionized, and now you have all these free radicals floating around. Free radicals is a term you might have heard when we talk about like eating healthy food because it helps to, you know, prevent or, you know, reduce free radicals and things like that. And it, it basically gives your body um, things to pair up with those free radicals so they're not floating around trying to do more damage. Um, but so anyway, so after the ionization, you have these free radicals floating around that recombine because that's what they want to do. They're very chemically reactive. They want to recombine, but they recombine into things like H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, which is damaging to, um, to our cells. So we don't, you know, we don't want excess hydrogen peroxide floating around in our body. So um, more x-ray energy absorbed and deposited equals more damage to the chemicals of life. So there's a higher likelihood that it's going to hit water, which is still um, damaging because of the free radicals and, and um, the cascading events that happen with the result of the free radicals and them trying to pair up. 
Um, but then there's also the, the chance of the X-ray fro- photon coming in and hitting some part of the, some part of the chemicals of life, which again would be like your DNA or your RNA or your ATP, something like that. There's many more that, that um, combine to make um, that cocktail of your chemicals of life, depending on the cell and all that. Okay, so um, so the physical process leading to the damage of the chemicals of life is divided into two categories, direct effect and indirect effect. And we've sort of touched on them already if I move forward. So the direct effect cell damage occurs when the ionizing radiation directly hits the chemicals of life within the cell and the result is death of the molecule. So when that um, x-ray photon comes in and it's like a direct hit, it's just wiped out and that it's damaged, um, it just causes the cell to die. Um, it doesn't function properly anymore or it just dies altogether. This occurs relatively infrequently because there's so much more water than, than this, these chemicals of life. The indirect effect, ionizing radiation deposited in the water instead of in the chemicals of life, um, and free radicals are formed by radiolysis. And, um, and then, but that process, and I basically, I think I already said this all, that process, that cascade of events still leads to um, mole- molecular um, or molecule doesn't function properly anymore or it dies because of those free radicals that are formed and then they they pair up and make new um, molecules like hydrogen peroxide molecules floating around which essentially still can cause damage and cell death. And this occurs much more frequently. It's just like a couple extra steps before we get to the cellular death part as opposed to just like one, you know, boom, the x-ray photon hits the DNA and it's it's done. It's just like another step in that process. All right, so it takes time for radiation damage um, to cause visible damage. And the time between radiation exposure and observable biologic damage is called the latent period. So latent periods can be short or long depending on the total dose. Fortunately, we do repair ourselves quite well when the dose is spread out and relatively low. The radiation dose you received, say, you know, like 10 years ago when you had a full body CT scan still remains with you for life because the effects of radiation is accumulative and it's sort of almost like carrying around a scar. So there will be there'd be evidence of it in your body somewhere. Um, but not that you would necessarily know about it, Um, but it does stay with you, um, the damage to cells. Um, And every subsequent exposure to radiation adds to that accumulative amount. So that's why it matters how much radiation we have. You know, I have had patients who have had um, cancer treatments and they've said, I just have had so much radiation, I just don't want any more. Um, can I just put my x-rays off for another year? And I would say, of course, you know, if they have an acute condition of something going on, that might be different. But um, very often, if something like that is going on and they've had cancer treatments, we would definitely want to put off, even though the dental x-rays are still going to be minuscule compared to what they've been through, it's sometimes it's a psychological thing too. They just want a break from the radiation. Um, So the good news, though, is that um, our cells have the ability to repair relatively um, well, especially if the doses are spread out over time or they're low or they're in areas that are not quite so radiosensitive, which we'll talk about more, too. Okay, sorry, I had to go get a drink. I have the hiccups, so hopefully they won't keep interrupting me here. But... um, So, I already said that. So, determining factors for radiation injury. So, there's a couple things that we think about um, when we think about um, the damaging effects of radiation. So, there's going to be more damage that happens with our higher KVP, higher frequency, shorter wavelength, higher energy, um, deeper penetrating. Um, x-ray photons. However, 
when we use this criteria for, um, for uh, x-rays, we get the best image. So we would rather take one good image that has a little bit more damaging x-ray than say like three bad images that we can't really see what we want because the contrast is not good. Um, and so really accumulatively, we'd be doing more damage the other way. So we'd rather have um, these higher quality, we call them higher quality x-ray photons, um, even though they are a little bit, they're more potent and they, and they cause more damage, but they also um, give us what we need so that we don't have to keep taking more x-rays. So when we think about a couple things here, when we think about the total dose, that's the quantity of radiation received or the amount of radiation absorbed. Um, a large dose is worse than a small dose. Um, dental x-rays considered a very small dose, and we'll talk more about that later and give some specifics. Uh, quality of the x-ray, so the higher energy penetrates deeper, the lower energy absorbs um, more in the superficial layers, and it's less damage to the deeper structures, but um, in the world of the x-rays, we won't see our detail as well. We won't, they're not as diagnostic. So low energy absorbed by superficial layers, high energy penetrates deeper. So the higher frequency can do more damage, but if we um, have a well, uh, a well take it, if we take our image well, um, we, um, I'm like, tr I'm critiquing the word well in my head, <laughs> made me stop being able to talk. If we take a good image um, with all the shades of gray, like I said, then, and we can see everything we need, then we don't have to keep exposing the patient over and over again, taking multiple films. Um, we just take what we need. So we want higher frequency, deeper penetrating x-rays to get a good, clear film. Um, so the total dose is the quantity of radiation received. Obviously, the larger the dose, the more damage to the cells. Um, and, and I'm just repeating myself. I'm reading my notes on the side here. And they're just what it says here. Um, so damaging factors for radiation in, um, injury. So we have amount, amount of tissue irradiated matters and then the cell sensitivity matters. So if we're talking about a very small, you know, two by two or three by three inch um, space uh, on the body, that is a very small area. There's very little scatter. Um, or if you're talking about like radiating the whole head or the whole side of your chest or something like that, there's going to be more damage um, involved in that. So total body radiation produces more adverse effects than a small lo localized area. Um, and then cell sensitivity, more damage occurs in cells that are more sensitive to radiation, such as rapidly dividing cells. Um, so very sensitive would be um, like blood forming and reproductive cells, very rapidly dividing. Um, less sensitive would be muscle cells and nerve cells. Um, they don't divide, near, you know, nearly to the rate that like your, your blood cells do or your reproductive cells do. The other thing, too, that we have to think about is age. Children are much more susceptible to radiation damage than adults because um, they're growing so much faster. Their cells are dividing so much faster. Um, and then a dose rate, more damage takes place with a high dose rate because of rapid delivery doesn't allow for the cells to, um, to repair. So if you're dosing a lot and very often, it's, you're not going to have nearly the, the chance to repair the cells, and so more damage is going to be done. So dose rate, um, rate at which exposure to the radiation occurs and absorption takes place. So dose rate is equal to dose divided by time. More radiation damage takes place with higher dose rate because a rapid delivery of radiation does not allow for the cellular damage to be repaired. Um, acute versus chronic exposure. So acute um, energy is given in a, um, in a short amount of time, um, and so the effects are going to be worse because your body doesn't have a chance to recuperate or heal. 
things that are done over time, spread out, the damage is going to be less because you're going to you're going to be able to or the the effects are going to be less the damaging effects are going to be less because you're going to have time to recuperate. So small amount of radiation given over a longer period of time is considered chronic. Body has time to repair the damage between exposures. Dental x-rays would be an example of a chronic exposure because we just do a little bit every year, every two years, every three years. So, um, Somatic tissue and genetic tissue. So radiation biologists divide human tissue into two categories. Somatic tissue, which is pretty much everything besides anything that has to do with genetics and reproduction. So somatic effects are seen, um, actually I think, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so somatic um, radiation effects basically are going to be, they're going to affect the person who is having the radiation done to them. So if I am having radiation to treat a cancer and it's affecting my somatic tissue, then I'm going to feel those effects. I may lose my hair. I may have red burned um, skin, you know, I, these kind of things. Um, or something like more cancer or leukemia or cataracts if radiation happens and you're um, exposing the lens to, of your eye. So the only effect is going to be for me. Tissues are not inherited from generation to generation. You develop your own, and the fetus develops their own tissue. They don't get their tissue from their mom. Get genetics from their mom and dad, but not the actual tissue. Um, so from that, then the other kind um, would be genetic out or um, genetic outcomes so damage to genetic tissue are responsible for producing damage that can be seen in generations so if the egg or the sperm is damaged then the offspring is going to have possibly have some kind of genetic mutation some, a birth defect a higher risk for cancer something like this um, so the so if I was having some treatment done that was sending radiation to my ovaries or something and, and my eggs got uh, some radiation, then but I may be totally fine. I'd never even have any kind of physical effects, perhaps. But my children could have higher risk for cancers or birth defects. This is a little picture from the textbook that shows so radiation is coming in and it's going to hit genetic reproduction re reproductive cells the dog you know this dog is we call him doggy a doggy a is fine but doggy b which was their offspring will have the effects um, radiation comes in and hits somatic tissue from doggy a doggy a doesn't feel so good but doggy a's baby is fine I don't know that that helped you at all with all the A's and the B's, but um, that's it. So if, it, if genetic tissue is being radiated, um, then the offspring is going to have an effect. If it's somatic tissue that's being radiated, then that, per, that individual is going to feel the effects, but their offspring won't be affected by it. Okay, animals exposed to radiation to somatic tissue don't produce visible changes in tissue until a certain threshold dose has been met. So um, the threshold dose basically means that you can, you can get radiation and not see any effects at all until you've hit the threshold. So you can go and go and go and then all of a sudden, boop, that's the threshold dose and now we lose our hair or now we feel nauseous and tired and um, something, you know, along these lines. So it normally requires large dose, similar to a sunburn. You don't go outside and get burned right away. You get burned once you've been out there for a certain amount of time, and, and then it starts to accumulate and you get burned. So um, examples, hair loss, skin reddening, cataract formation, or sterility. So the threshold dose is the amount that appears to have visible effects, a small exposure, no visible um, no visible change, high exposure, then you start to get the visible change. 
exposure of genetic tissue to radiation causes mutation. So a mutation is a change in the information contained by the chromosomes in the, either the sperm or the egg. Um, and mutations have the ability to produce children with higher likelihood of birth defects or cancers or leukemia. And mutations follow a non-threshold or a linear type of dose response. So this is different from um, somatic tissue. Somatic tissue is more of the threshold dose. So you go until you hit that certain spot and then you get the react the effects. But um, the genetic tissue follows a linear. So a little bit of exposure, a little bit of potential for mutation. A lot of exposure, a lot of uh, mutation. So there is no, you can do it a little bit and then you hit the threshold. It's just the amount of exposure and the amount of mutation rise at the same time. So it's a linear, kind of a linear um, effect or a linear response as opposed to the threshold for the somatic tissue. Okay, so this slide is showing the results of disease for critical organs. So if the lens of the eye got a lot of radiation, cataracts could happen. If the reproductive cells got a lot of gut radiation, you'll have genetic mutation. Um, if uh, an, a developing fetus gets radiation, they could have congenital defects, which would be um, as they're forming. Those defects happen as they're forming. Um, bone marrow leukemia, thyroid gland cancer, and skin cancer. So not all cells respond to radiation in the same manner. Um, a cell that's sensitive to radiation is termed radiosensitive. One that is resistant is termed uh, radioresistant. And the response of a cell to radiation exposure is determined by a couple different things. So it's determined by its um, mitotic activity. That's the cells that divide frequently or undergoing many divisions. Um, over time, so fast develop, um, mitotic activity would be like quickly dividing cells. They are more sensitive. Cell differentiation, cells that are immature and are not highly specialized, they're more sensitive. So if a cell hasn't decided what it wants to be yet, it's, it's more sensitive to radiation than a cell that has um, decided it's a muscle cell. Um, cell metabolism. Cells that have a higher metabolism are more sensitive to radiation, and cells that are radiosensitive include blood cells, because remember those are rapidly dividing, they're, they're always forming, immature reproductive cells, and young um, bone marrow, young bone um, cells of children, so children in general. And then the cell that is most sensitive to radiation is the small lymphocyte cells, those are the most sensitive. Radioresistant cells include like, um, you know, like adults' bones, um, not the bone marrow, but the bone itself, muscle and nerve cells, because those are pretty like stable. They're just, you know, there. They've, um, and so, and so they, they don't react as much to the radiation. They're not as sensitive to the radiation. So here's a picture that um, these are the critical organs that we have to be aware of because we have the thyroid gland right here. Um, there, of course, there's bone marrow in our jaws, in our bones, in our face, um, skin, and then being sure we never um, direct the beam of radiation into the lens of our patient's eye. Um, and we do take radi you know, we do take radiographs from the front, but we want to make sure that the, the direction is not right into their eyes. Um, a critical organ is an organ that is damaged, dismin um, diminishes the quality of a person's life. Critical organs exposed during dental imaging um, in the head and neck are thyroid, bone marrow, skin, and lens of the eye. Radiation um, measurements and units. So exposure is the amount of radiation that comes out of an x-ray unit and reaches the person. And then not all is absorbed, some passes through them. So they were exposed to it, but not all of it was taken into their body. Some of it just went flying right through to the other side. So a dose, or the absorbed dose, that's the amount of radiation that was actually deposited into the tissue. And the, um, 
the amount that is actually absorbed. So the measurement of radiations are measured in units and are um, used to define three quantities of radiation, exposure, dose, and dose equi equivalent. Dose equivalent is the concept that allows comparison of the biological effects of different types of ionizing radiation. So there's different types such as alpha particles, gamma rays, beta particles, and x-rays. So that it allows to kind of compare and contrast those, those different types of rate ionizing radiation. Equal doses of different types of radiation produce different levels of biological damage. So, um, so they're not all equal. So an equal, um, an equal dosing of alpha particles compared and x-rays um, are going to are going to affect the biology of the cell differently. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. So different types of radiation have different effects on the tissue. The dose equivalent measurement is used to compare the biological effects of different types of radiation. The traditional unit of dose equivalent is the Renkin equivalent in man or the REM. So the traditional unit of measurement is REM, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Total amount of radiation a person is getting is, um, is the dose. Okay, so this is where it gets a little hairy um, and, and pretty confusing, really. Um, so radiation can be measured in the same manner as other physical concepts, such as measuring time or me measuring distances or measuring weight. Um, you can think of it as, um, oh, and then there's two systems, though. There's kind of an older traditional system from when they first discovered radiation and all this. They used this, this old system here that was made up of the Renkin, the RAD, and the REM. The REM stands for Ren Renkin. What does it stand for? I have to look at my... Um, oh, I just said it in the last video. Um, Renkin something in men. What's the E stand for? I can't remember. Anyway, so, the, um, so that's sort of the older system of how they would measure um, the dosage. And then the unit measurements of the units of radiation. And now a new system um, it is discussed in um, Coulombs, Grays, and Sieverts. So you can kind of think it, you can kind of think about it as like inches to um, meters, you know, in, inches and meters, or Fahrenheit and Celsius. It's measuring the same thing, but different units of measurement. So um, in dental imaging, the gray and the sievert are equal. Um, and the Renkin and the RAD and the REM are considered approximately equal. Smaller multiples of these radiation units are typically used um, in dentistry because we're dealing with such a small, so we deal in like micro sieverts, basically, millisieverts. Um, so we don't talk about a full sievert because dental radiation is much smaller than that. You get a much smaller dose, so we're talking about millisieverts. Um, the prefix is milli means one, um, one thousandth, micro meaning one millionth. Um, this allows the dental radiographer to express small quantities of exposure, dose, and dose equivalent. Um, let's see if I can say this without it sounding confusing. For example, one millisievert is a point zero zero one sievert, and one micro sievert is point zero 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 one sievert. So it's very small, very, very small. And this is measuring the absorbed dose. So this came out of the book. This is a conversion guide to kind of um, to kind of say RAM or, or RAD or REMS to grays and sieverts. Um, so a, a column, I'm sure I'm saying that totally wrong, um, the C-O-U-L-O-M-B, 
Um, it's a unit of electrical charge and the quantity of electrical charge transferred by one amp um, in one second. So I don't expect you to remember that or need to know that for any, but I thought I, I would at least say the definition and the definitions in the book in case you're more curious and you like this kind of thing and you want to go more in depth and under, have a greater understanding. To place the exposure um, effects of different types of radiation on a common scale, they use a um, quality factor or QF. So in here where it says one rem equals rad times the quality factor, um, or one sievert equals uh, gray times the quality factor, they, in dentistry we kind of, because we're dealing with such a small amount, we basically consider them equal. But this is a more precise conversion, um, which again, you're not going to be tested on conversion um, at all. So um, you don't have to worry about that part. Each type of radiation has a specific quality factor based on different types of radiation producing different types of biological damage. For example, the QF for one x-ray is equal to one. Um, so you can see that that's why, that's why one sievert and one gray are pretty much equal to each other. Because one sievert equals gray times one, that would just, that would be the same thing. So it's like one to one. Comparing rad and rem to gray and sievert. So it's important for you to know that gray and sieverts are a hundred times bigger than rad and rem. So of anything that I really want you to know is I want you to know the terms. I want you to know that rad and rem and gray and sievert are units of measurement, measuring radiation dosage. I want you to know that, those terms. Um, and then you should also know that gray and sieverts are larger than rad and rem. So a um, hundred times bigger than rad and rem. So example, so one sievert is a hundred rem and um, one gray is a hundred rad. So it's like one to a hundred. Okay, so this is a very, very good slide because this will really help you explain to a patient um, if you have something, giving them something more concrete to compare, um, to give them a perspective to how much radiation, their, their radiation dose that they're getting with a dental x-ray. So again, we're talking in micro sieverts. So these are millionth, right? Um, millionth of a, um, of a sievert. So they are have they get for one and with uh, remember there's the difference between the collimation that's um, rectangular or um, circular. You get less radiation with the rectangular collimator. So uh, one bite wing taken on with a rectangular collimation is two microsieverts. Um, Chances are many of you who have taken x-rays before use the round collimator, that's nine sieverts. So um, for one bite wing. Um, a complete series with a rectangular collimator is 35 microsieverts. And then a complete series with a round collimator is 170 microsieverts. However, if the average US person walking around, just living their life, um, is going to get um, 3,000 um, microsieverts. Is that microsieverts? Oh no, 3,000 sieverts. So that's three, that's three millisieverts. 3,000, because 1,000 microsieverts equals one millisievert. Yeah, so they're basically, so the average U.S. Um, person with getting exposed to background radiation per year is 3,000 microsieverts, which is three millisieverts. So that's just, that's just living life, not doing anything. That's just going to the store, you know, maybe, maybe that's 
also taking into account flying in an airplane, but that's just living life. Um, that's, and so you can see one, one dental x-ray is two microsieverts as opposed to 3,000 for just living life. So it's a very, very small percentage of um, the radiation that they are going to get. They're going to, they're going to, and we don't want to just say, oh, you get more radiation just walking around. Because sometimes that's what it distills to. But if you can, and we understand it, we get that, that you just live in life, you get radiation, ah, you know, but they don't understand that you know those, those conversions. So what's really nice is for you to say um, something like, well, radiation is measured in sieverts. And um, we measure dental, dental x-rays in microsieverts because it's so small. Um, and it's interesting to know that the average U.S. person is exposed to 3,000 microsieverts for doing nothing but living life, just being exposed to the environment. Um, and one dental x-ray is only two microsieverts. So if you set it to them with a little bit of background information, especially if somebody's like really terrified, then you are doing them such a huge favor because being able to give them that perspective is, is invaluable. Then they feel like, oh, that is a lot smaller compared to, you know, my daily life. So this is, so I encourage you to um, really get to know this kind of data so that you can share that with patients in the future. And here's another one. So um, this would be millisieverts, I believe. So 20 millisieverts, um, average over five years for somebody who's in a high risk um, work environment, like somebody who works in a factory where there's lots of radiation or something like that, if they're in a high risk for, for being exposed to lots of radiation, their, um, their uh, dosage would be, um, so that's over a five year period, so in one year, that would be four millisieverts. So they get four millisieverts a year. The average typical background radiation from natural sources in North America is three um, millisieverts. So somebody who works in a high um, radiation environment typically gets one more uh, millisievert of um, radiation. People who work in the dental field are considered typical background radiation workers, not um, not radiological personnel. We don't get exposed to enough to bump us up into, you know, this is employees in nu nuclear industry or hospital workers like a, um, somebody who's constantly taking, um, you know, like PET scans or something like that. Okay, so we're going to give our patients the least amount of radiation we can in order to get the information that we need. And that policy is dictated by what we call a LARA, um, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, as low as reasonably allowable. So there may be a lot of errors in our film. We may not take the most beautiful film, but we only want to retake the films that is missing the diagnostic information that we need to make the, the judgments in the treatment plan. So when we go through and critique our films, um, we can see a little bit of overlapping, we may see a cone cut, we may um, have something be crooked and it just doesn't, it's the placement got wonky, but if we are able to see all the bone, the interproximal, um, the, the doctor feels that they are completely capable of looking and seeing the, um, seeing what they need to see, then, then we don't do retakes. So um, usually if you feel like you have taken films that you're not super proud of when you're in a private practice, you could always say, hey, can you look at the, you want me to retake this one molar? I, you know, um, close the contacts and, um, you know, I don't know if you need that to see what's in between. You know, I can't really tell myself, so I, I but I didn't want to take a retake until I checked with you. You know, you can have these conversations with the doctor. Um, so patient protection, we only want to take the, the x-rays that we need. We want to base them on our patient's need for risk assessment and our clinical examination. And we want to take them really good the first time so we don't have to take a, another one because of a mistake we've made. 
um, and because retakes are, are going to double the amount of radiation. If we only have to take one as opposed to having to take two or three, we are exponentially increasing their radiation from mistakes from, you know, and I don't want to make you guys feel bad because some people are hard to take good films on and they fight you sometimes. Patients can gag and like just, you know, wiggle and make it really challenging to take a film. And so I don't want you to feel really guilty if you have to do a retake, but just work with that principle. I want to do my best, my best job so that I reduce the amount of radiation for my patient. And you just do, you know, we just do our, do our best really. And if it, if it's not perfect, that's totally fine and acceptable. We just work toward improving. Um, okay. The next one here. So protection. So what do we do to protect our patients and ourselves? Well, a few things are we have moved to digital um, radiography, which almost, I mean, I, I don't know about every practice in America. I'm sure there are still some that use traditional films, but um, many, 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 many practices have gone to digital films. And then if they are using traditional films, usually they would use um, a faster speed film because um, that also um, decreases the patient's um, radiation. So if there's there at least though one of those two things is typically what any modern practice these days would be doing. The kilovoltage, there's a minimum of 60 kVp. Um, ours is 65 in the clinic. Um, so you, you wouldn't see an x-ray head that, or at least you shouldn't, that is, goes below that because that's also helping us have good diagnostic films right out the gate. We don't have that kind of foggy look to them. Most modern x-ray machines operate at 70 or higher. Um, and then filtration of the beam, you remember that there is that, um, there's that aluminum filtration that um, is right at the end, right before the collimator comes out, there's that filtration that takes out all the kind of weak, um, the longer wavelengths, the um, the lower frequency um, X-ray photons, it kind of absorbs them out of the central beam, so that we get just really those those really high quality X-ray beams to to get a good picture the first time. So the other things we do for um, patient protection is the collimation of the beam. Um, the rectangle, we've said a lot now, that's less radiation for the patient. It's more specific. It's hitting just one specific area that's the size of the sensor. And a longer cone is preferred as well. It, it makes it so that the, um, the central beam doesn't spread out as much. So it keeps it, you know, um, going straight longer, and so when it finally does come out, it doesn't doesn't do this big spreading. Patient protection collimation of the beam, rectangular collimation is preferred, um, reduces the exposure area, reduces patient radiation by 50, at least 50 percent, if not more. We use XEPs. These have um, help with our um, accuracy and to reduce errors and retakes. These are other things that we do to help protect our patients and reduce their radiation dose. The lead apron, um, adults don't have to wear a lead apron anymore um, except for um, a thyroid collar for some, some um, circumstances, but um, we, we were, you know, people who have been wearing lead aprons Children still have to because um, because of their rapid cell division, but we are always going to put a lead apron on our patient because at this point people, I mean, unless something changes in the future, at this point people have been wearing lead aprons for so long that it would take longer to explain it and convince them that it's fine rather than to just put on a lead apron. It doesn't do any harm. Um, people are used to it. And um, what people really like is the thyroid collar because this is the area that of anything is really the most sensitive area that they're going to get the most exposure. So to cover up their thyroid is, is probably one of the, 
you know, best things we can do and the best reason to wear, um, a, to wear a lead apron still. Um, proper processing to avoid retakes. This is more pertinent if you're using traditional films. Um, you, you know, the picture just pops right up when you take the picture with digital, so you it really is no processing with a digital system. Um, radiation protection for the operator. So knowing the source um, of the exposure to the operator, knowing where the central ray is coming out in what direction, and then the scatter. If we're six feet away um, and there's a wall between us, um, that X-ray that X-ray photon isn't going to travel past the six feet, and it can't pen penetrate through the wall after that either. So if we go outside and of the room to push the button, and our patient is facing us now, they're looking out that little window. The radiation is going in a totally opposite direction of us. So if we're standing here. And then the radiation goes, you know, this way, or goes back behind the patient, or goes the other way. But it's not, it's not coming out toward us. And even if it did, um, the the walls there, and we're more than six feet away. So we're in a plenty range of safety. Um, but as an extra precaution, just always have your face, your patient, patient facing out of the room. Um, radiation protection for the operator, stand at least six feet away, stand outside of the room, never stand in the direct line of the central ray, never hold a film in a patient's mouth. Um, they can hold their film. If you want, you know, once you put the film in there, they, if it's not stable, they can reach out here. You can put their hand um, out here on the bar. The, the BID is going to be coming coming down here, and you can have them hold it and stabilize it for you. Um, as a lot of times they'll they'll go like this or they'll or they'll go like this or something and you just have to direct their hand to get it out of the, the way of the beam so that it just doesn't get in the way of the picture. But they can hold it and stabilize it. But don't you ever do that because you're the one that has to take x-rays for your entire career. You don't want to be holding films for people even once a week because that still increases your radiation, your dose of radiation. Um, so, and you know, sometimes maybe, I don't know if anyone who's worked as a dental assistant has ever seen that happen before. I certainly have in my career. There are like, I've worked with um, lots of hygienists and dental assistants who would hold the film and say, hey, could you press the button for me? I'm just gonna hold it for her. Or, you know, because they can't tolerate it. And so I was like, all right, press the button. But, you know, it, it's, I just would never expose, you know, if, if they do it, it's their choice and you're going to run into it, but I would never do that for yourself. Never be the one to hold the film. Have your patient hold the film if you need st um, stabilizing. And this just shows um, the range of safety being six feet and then um, in this, I'm really, I, I think it's saying that if you're off to the side. This is the margin of safety. I'm not even sure this diagram kind of confuses me. But if you are out of the room and six feet away, there's no way that the radiation is going to hit, um, reach you. So you're perfectly safe. Okay, I think I skipped. I think it skipped one. Um, so when we talk about our maximal maximum permissible dose, um, very little chance for us to have somatic or genetic injury with our with with the maximum permissible dose. It's still very low. So if you are a worker, say um, you work with radiation a lot, um, then you have a range of up to 50 millisieverts, which is five rem a year for your whole body exposure. The general public, the maximum permissible dose is five millisieverts. So that's 0.5 rem for your whole body for the whole year. Pregnant operators fall under these guidelines of the general pop, um, public as well. So, um, in, and we would, as healthcare workers, we don't even get, as dental hygienists, we don't even get close to this maximum permissible dose. Now, if you're concerned, you can wear something called a dosimeter. 
and um, you can wear this um, and send it in like every so often, once a month, and they'll send it back um, and let you know. But you won't, you shouldn't even get even remotely close to what would be your maximum permissible dose. But especially if you're pregnant or you're going through cancer treatment or you're just concerned about radiation, you'd certainly wear one of these dose meters um, to um, monitor your exposure. All right, that's that. See you in the next one.